Hey everyone, welcome to the lunch. We have Gavyan here to talk about data driven semi supervised learning. And our results today are sponsored in part by Smart Contract Research Forum. The same as <laughs> Thanks, Pranit. Yeah, uh, I am Dravi, and uh, welcome everyone to Theory Lunch. And this particular talk, uh, even though the topic of the talk is uh, machine learning theory, we'll be tailoring it towards a general CS audience because it's also part of my speaking skills talk. Uh, all right, so the topic of the talk is data driven semi supervised learning. And this is joint work with my advisor, Professor Nina Balkin. And the work also appeared in the NeurIPS conference last year as an oral presentation. Right. So this is the layout of my talk. I'll start with some brief motivation. Uh, right. So we all know something about machine learning. And uh, uh, let's see if uh, you can uh, identify how to solve this common application for machine learning, which is spam classification, right? So if you get an email which says you have won, send your bank details to claim this money, it's probably a spam email. But uh, if it's an advisor, an email from my advisor, I want to probably not put it into my spam folder. So this, uh, the two examples are uh, label of the data, data which is unlabeled, which it was just the email, but if we add the categories spam and not spam, it's a label data set, right? And uh, the technique of learning from unlabeled data is called supervised learning. But a major issue with supervised learning is that uh, annotating data manually is very, very expensive. So typically how it's done is you would hire a bunch of workers and give them a bunch of unlabeled examples like pictures and ask them to you know provide labels by manually examining each and every picture and marking it as a dog or a horse or a bird. And you need to pay these workers a lot of money. So it's uh, probably not the best way to learn from these examples. On the other hand, just unlabeled data is, is just available very cheaply and very plentifully. People generate unlabeled data all the time. When you simply write an email or generate a comment on an internet forum or use your smartphone you keep generating all this unlabeled data all the time. So we want to talk about this paradigm of learning called semi-supervised learning, which is able to exploit this unlabeled data in addition to labeled examples. So the question now uh, that you must be thinking about is how do you even learn from unlabeled data, right? So labeled data tells you exactly what the category was. Your ultimate goal is to you know, tell whether your email was spam or not spam, but just from looking at emails, how can you tell whether it's, how can you even hope to learn? So in fact, to give this example, we have, suppose we have uh, points in two dimensions and uh, we, have, we have uh, two positive points, let's say spam and three negative points, not spam. And now we want to guess the label for this unlabeled point. Right. Uh, so any guesses? I think just from these labeled examples, you would be tempted to say that this is a positive point because it's close to two positive points, but uh, further from the negative set of negative points. But suppose now you also look at your unlabeled data sets, right? So all your email, bunch of emails that you see, which are similar to each other. And now you look at your data set in this feature space, uh, you might be tempted to make mark it as a negative point or a spam, right? So essentially what's happening here is that unlabeled data has some properties, some information, which we call as features. And uh, we can use this feature similarity of unlabeled examples to exploit this uh, uh, unlabeled data for semi-supervised learning. And one extremely popular and effective way to do this is to build a graph, which is able to not just look at those local patterns which we were looking when we were trying to use those labeled examples, but also some global data patterns. So for example, one way to add a graph to these points is to just join them by some edges. And, uh, and this kind of indicates, you know, if you're in the same uh, component of the graph, you might want to label it uh, using the, this label of that component. But the major question uh, which we will try to address in this talk is how to even build this graph. So that would be the theme of this talk. Right. 
So in uh, order to uh, formalize things a little bit, we'll define the distance metric DUV. So we already mentioned this informally in the previous slide. You would have some notion of similarity between unlabeled examples. We call this a metric DUV. And you, you can use this metric to set graph edges. And there are various popular ways of doing this uh, in the literature. So one simple way is to build an unweighted graph, just pick a real value threshold R, and if the examples are for, less further away than R, then you would add an edge, otherwise uh, no edge is added between the pair. Similarly, you could add weighted edges, uh, which you know scale polynomially or exponentially with the distance metric. And each of these uh, graph families or uh, algorithmic families have uh, a parameter. So, the question now becomes a question of learning the graph uh, in this uh, in these examples is just to learn this parameter value in the appropriate graph family and uh, the main results which we prove in this paper are can be summarized as follows so we show that there is an efficient algorithm to learn the optimal graph parameter for these families uh, in other words you can uh, Given your data set, you can figure out what value of choosing the graph parameter will lead to best extrapolation from your labeled examples to the unlabeled examples. And we can do this uh, efficiently or in polynomial time. Uh, there's another extension to this result that we can uh, also give an algorithm for multimodal data where you can have multiple feature metrics. Uh, and the distance metric in that case would be uh, simple interpolation of these distance metrics. So the bulk of this talk would be to set up result fun, and uh, we'll also briefly talk about how the technique extends to the multimodal set. Right. So now we'll formalize uh, things a little bit more. We'll look at the details of the model. Right. So we've already seen this part of the model, which is building the graph. Right. So you to build a graph, you need a graph parameter sigma, which we hope to learn and this feature distance, which we assume is given, right? In addition to this, you would also need a labeling algorithm. So previously I just, in this example, I just, you know, said you take the label of the component, but you know, you might not get very clean components in the general data. So you would need an algorithm for deciding what, uh, how to extrapolate those labels given the graph, right? The algorithm is also given these few labeled examples and the bulk of unlabeled examples. Right, so this part of the uh, of this uh, learning learning process has been well studied. For example, uh, you know there, there's there's a ton of literature on uh, you know how to learn once the graph is fixed, and uh, there's there's a general formulation which is to minimize some loss function, which depends on the graph, right? And uh, for example, you can have this loss function, which depends on F, which is the uh, label that we are trying to predict for each node. Uh, for example, if it's a binary label, it's in zero and one. And uh, uh, you can formulate this uh, loss function, which uh, if you restrict your, uh, your uh, prediction F to zero and one, it co corresponds to a mean cut in the graph, which kind of makes sense because you know when you're trying to label all the points as zero and one, essentially you're trying to partition the graph into two sets, or in other words, finding a cut, and uh, it is natural to find a min cut, right? So let's uh, go back to our previous example. So suppose there are also these blue edges in your graph, which are, which have lower weight because you know they are further apart from those black edges. Uh, so a natural way to design a cut would be to just cut away the blue edges. So that would be kind of a min cut in this graph, and that would, also yield the same components, even though in this case, the graph was initially connected. On the other hand, uh, there are even more effective methods. You could, instead of imposing hard labels, there's this notion of soft labels where you now allow F to be zero and one, solve the same optimization problem with an algorithm. In this case, it turns out there's even a closed form for the solution. And you would essentially then round off those labels to get the, uh, predicted labels. Uh, this is a very effective technique and uh, there's a bunch of other techniques by, by tweaking the loss function and uh, uh, which leads to different algorithms because the optimization objective changes. Right, so now we've seen a few examples of the algorithm. 
uh, finally, the goal of the algorithm is to, uh, you know, uh, predict the labels, but uh, turns out uh, most of the research uh, has just focused on uh, this part where you decide how to extrapolate those labels given the graph, right? And uh, it continues uh, to be an active topic for research. On the other hand, the question of how to build the graph, which is still uh, because you know it appears even before in this process, is uh, considered more of an art than science. This was the state about 20 years ago, and uh, a lot of people have recoded this over the years. And uh, even till date, there is there are no principled ways of building the graph. And uh, we want to make a step in this direction. We want to give a principled algorithm with formal guarantees of uh, selecting the graph parameter, or in other words, making graph construction more of a science. Right. Uh, so a challenge that we immediately hit when we when we when we try to understand why uh, why this is hard is is. Uh, so, uh, is, is to look at a simple example, uh, which shows that a single instance of the problem might not be even enough to learn the best parameter, right? So suppose you have uh, an unlabeled gray node and uh, like a few blue nodes, three blue nodes, and like 10 red nodes, right? Uh, and the blue nodes are slightly closer to the gray node, right? So as you increase your parameter threshold R, uh, if you're using your min cut algorithm, well, uh, there, yeah, they're all in separate components. You don't really know which way to color you, but if you increase your threshold a little more, now these blue nodes get connected and your min cut would pass through, uh, well, there's an em empty min cut since they're separate components and you would label the node blue. If you increase your threshold a little more, now, since there were fewer edges to the blue nodes, your, uh, node, your edges on the left would be on the cut and uh, in this case, you would label you red. So just from a single instance of the problem, it's not clear whether you want to label you blue or red. And depending upon how you set the threshold of the graph, you would end up labeling it differently for the same problem. Yeah? So something you could do to abstain from making predictions? One and the other is you could just like ignore you, right? Like it's in some low density region of the data or something. So yeah. It's not like very obvious that this is a problem for example. Right. So this is this is like an example where you lie in the low density region, but for example, you can imagine there being a lot of points. So in general, we don't even know where the boundaries are, right? For your data set. And there can be a lot of points which are further away from uh, uh, you know points for, from the labeled examples that you know. Uh, and as you add the edge, so this just is a very simple example. And you don't need to think too much about the uh, you know the low density properties, but the idea is as you increase the graph parameter, you could uh, the message is you can flip the label, right? Uh, that can happen in a lot of other circumstances as well. This is just a very uh, simple example. Yeah, uh, in general, yeah, there can be strategies for abstaining or uh, you know uh, other ways to handle this case, this particular case. But uh, yeah, you in general just because you can have uh, you know, extrapolation uh, and under this uncertain, you know, uh, graph connections, you can, you can get different answers for different connectivities, right? Okay, so, so recall the full setup again. Now we have this loss function uh, L of sigma, which depends on the original graph parameter sigma, and we can uh, compute it given all the labels for all the points. Right, so once the algorithm makes some prediction, we can, uh, if, suppose we have all the labels, we can compute this loss function, right? Uh, and our goal is now, uh, since we realize we can't, we can't uh, just use a single example, uh, we will model this uh, whole problem as a sequence of repeated problems or a natural way to formulate this is to use online learning. So the formulation is very simple. Instead of doing this, uh, this thing once, we will do the whole thing uh, several times over. So you're given a sequence of semi-supervised learning problems. And now you would select first the uh, graph, then you label the particular problem instance using the algorithm, and then uh, you, know, you suffer some loss and uh, you can update your graph based on the loss that you suffered. So you can do the whole process over and over again. So this is the uh, formal formulation of our model. Uh, 
Uh, and one key challenge that we need to overcome to uh, solve this is to uh, handle the loss function, which in this case is not very nice. Uh, so again, back to our example, uh, the loss function turns out to be piecewise constant. In other words, there are discontinuities in the loss function, which makes it hard to use your uh, favorite out of the box tools like uh, uh, gradient descent or uh, other techniques, which uh, depends on uh, uh, properties like conve convexity or uh, uh, smoothness of the function to work. Right, uh, as you can see, the uh, if, if the true label was blue, then the loss uh, would flip in a certain way. Uh, at the threshold, if it was red, it would flip the other way. But in either case, the uh, the loss function itself is uh, discontinuous at some threshold. So in general, the loss function can be piecewise constant because you know, as you're varying the threshold or some other parameter, the uh, it's it's a little more subtle for other parameters because they're the min cuts change at certain values of the threshold. But uh, again, the uh, common property is that the loss function is going to be a piecewise constant function of your graph parameter. And the question is, can we still optimize this in the online learning setting? Uh, so it turns out the worst case answer is no, uh, which means uh, if uh, there's an arbitrary sequence of loss functions, uh, there is no hope of you know, learning anything meaningful or getting close to the uh, real parameter, there can be adversarial sequences of loss functions or problem instances where uh, you would do really, really bad. Uh, but the worst case doesn't really happen in real life. And uh, so can we have some assumptions under which, uh, you know, which may be satisfied in real world data and we can still learn this function. So that's uh, something we can uh, we'll next try to address. And uh, turns out the answer to this is yes, there's a, there's a nice uh, uh, property of these loss functions under which they are learnable. And turns out this property is both necessary and sufficient. So it's a very interesting property. Uh, so the uh, high level idea is that the discontinuities of your loss function are not concentrated in any single interval. Uh, and more formally, if there is any interval with, uh, with epsilon at least one over root t, and it is the number of uh, loss functions that you experience, then the maximum number of discontinuities uh, is uh, uh, for, for any such interval in expectation over the uh, drop the problem instances is upper bounded. Uh, a little more pictorially, uh, you have uh, a function where, you know, there's a lot of these discontinuities in this small interval. Uh, it would not be dispersed if it exceeds that upper bound. Uh, in expectation, but uh, a nicer function in which you know there are fewer discontinuities in, in every possible interval over the entire domain, we we, we can uh, we can we, that function will be dispersed or will satisfy this requirement. All right. So, so the graph is learnable, provide the loss function satisfies this this property, but we still need to show that uh, the loss function actually satisfies this property. So that uh, sets up for our main results. Uh, if there are any questions at this point about the setup or uh, motivation, let me know before I jump into the exciting new results. So in the previous slide, in the, the expectation, um, so it's just expectation over the instances or? Yes. Uh, so. In principle, your algorithm, if your algorithm is randomized, then the expectation will also be over the randomization of the algorithm. But uh, uh, we always assume that the problems, uh, you know, the expectation will always be over some, the problems might be coming from some distribution and the expectation will be over the distribution generating these loss functions, these uh, problem instances or loss functions. Yeah, yeah, and potentially even the algorithm. If it could, yeah, you can. Uh, for example, you can design a, so even if your data doesn't is not very nice. You can design a randomized algorithm such that this property is satisfied. In which case, we can still uh, give the guarantee. So just by using uh, parameters of the algorithm, you might be able to uh, 
Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so yeah, this is definitely a bit more challenging, but I think this uh, is definitely a very, very useful property. As I said, you know, it helps. Uh, it, it's, it turns out we can show lower bounds that this is also, which shows that this is a necessary condition to learn uh, these piecewise constant functions. Yeah. So, sorry, for the right side of the circuit, yeah, T is the number of rounds, a number of problems that you'll see. Uh, so maybe you don't satisfy it for the first kind of instance, but your algorithm will update so that this is satisfied. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I mean, it's not well defined if you, uh, well, if you maybe say just one instance, you have some number of instances, some time horizon T over which you can verify this property, whether it's satisfied or not. So uh, yeah, in practice, it makes sense to, Think of T as uh, this large number of instances, which are so in some sense sufficient for you to learn the uh, loss function meaningfully. Okay, so moving on to the main results. So you use yeah. a different sigma for each instance and compare with the best sigma for all them. Yes, exactly. That's that's the paradigm for online learning. I'll formally state this soon. So we will use an online algorithm that is already known uh, to which, which works as follows. Uh, we call this algorithm E because it sort of exponentiates the loss functions. Uh, it would compute the pieces of the loss function. And uh, uh, you know, the, because in general you might want, it depends on the graph. So you need to do that yourself. Then you would add weights to each of those pieces corresponding to the loss for each of those pieces because each single piece would have a constant performance because that has the same loss value. Uh, and finally, you would sample from those uh, pieces of the parameter space according to their weights. A little more formally, you would start with a random distribution over your parameter space and in each round T, you would sample a parameter proportional to this exponentiated uh, total loss experienced by that parameter. Up, up to this point. And finally, you would uh, uh, use that parameter to build your graph at that for the time instance and suffer a loss and then repeat the whole thing. So this satisfies this whole uh, online learning game that uh, we introduced. What sort of access to the loss function do you Do you only know the loss function for the balance of one you use one graph? So for now, we'll assume that we know the entire loss function. Yeah. Right, because that's need to, needed to do the updates, right, in the, in the samples. Right, so for this uh, uh, setting uh, where we know the entire loss function, we can, uh, yeah, we have. So the algorithm enjoys uh, one over root t expected average regret. We will introduce these terms and uh, uh, under an assumption that the distance, distance metric is smooth. So, uh, let's see what this uh, result really means. So the algorithm was known, but uh, proving this analysis of this algorithm is, is the new contribution. And uh, the, yeah, so the regret is, is something that's well known uh, in machine learning literature. It's a very simple measure of performance for online learning algorithms. Just subtracts the loss that your algorithm, online algorithm O suffers in T rounds uh, uh, and compares it with the loss of the best possible parameter once you've seen all the, uh, all the uh, loss functions in hindsight. So that's uh, regret and uh, the average regret would just divide this by the number of rounds and expect an expectation would be over the you know, distribution from which loss functions appear or potentially uh, of the randomization of the algorithm. Uh, so that's regret. Uh, and uh, the distance metric being smooth essentially just means that it is distributed with this probability density function, which has an upper bound kappa on its uh, density. So this is just, uh, uh, just a mild assumption, which means intuitively it means that you know the 
pairwise distances are not very exact, or in other words, slight perturbations don't uh, to the pairwise distances don't change the problem too much. Right? So in other words, the problem is smooth with respect to slight perturbations. Under this uh, relatively mild assumption, uh, we can show that our algorithm enjoys one over root t expected average regret, which means as you increase the number of rounds t, the uh, regret that you experience goes to zero, which is nice. And it goes it goes it, uh, with this uh, quadratic rate. Uh, a key insight, again, as, uh, is, is definitely uh, for this proof is to actually prove that the sequence of loss functions is disperse. So that's, that's the uh, uh, main idea that we want to try to do, that uh, given the uh, distance metric is smooth, we can show that the loss function or the location of the discontinuities are, do, do not concentrate in any small region. So that's the key insight here. Right. Now, as uh, somebody, uh, as Pranit already asked that, uh, you know, uh, we, it's the algorithm that we presented so far needed to compute the entire loss function, right? And in general, there can be an exponential number of pieces. We even have examples uh, uh, because, you know, you're talking about a uh, number of different loss functions as you vary the cuts of the graph. Uh, and it's, it's possible to construct instances where there are exponentially many cuts or different uh, answers that your algorithm can give. So, which means, you know, your algorithm is not efficient. So, uh, turns out there's uh, this simple modification where you just compute the one piece where you make, were making the prediction. So, you still need to compute that piece algorithmically. For example, you need to compute the boundaries of that piece to determine the full length of the piece. But as long as you can do that and update your weights just for that interval in each round, you can, uh, uh, you can do this much more efficiently. So in, in our algorithms, we, uh, we, in our uh, setting for graph learning, we show that computing those uh, feedback sets or the boundaries for which we are making the prediction can be done in polynomial time. And uh, the regret is uh, slightly worse, but it still follows the same uh, quadratic decay. Uh, so that's that's nice. So we have an efficient algorithm which now achieves the, almost the same regret guarantees, but uh, can we implement it in polynomial time? Right. So uh, with that, I'll uh, move on to. More. So that was the main uh, chunk for the first result. We also had another result which is extending uh, the previous results to a multimodal setting. So what is multimodal data? Right. So Think of an application where you naturally have uh, two different modes of collecting data. For example, an audio-visual speech recognition, which is uh, a relatively upcoming uh, application. You have data for lip movements or lip reading, and also data for audio. And you can, uh, you know, use those to improve the quality of your speech recognition. Right, and such kind, of, such kind of uh, data is definitely going to be much more challenging to annotate because now. Uh, you know, labeling would be even more expensive, right? Because just you need to need a lot more data here. Uh, so the idea is uh, we can combine these distance metrics using some uh, parameters uh, which interpolate between the different metrics. And uh, while learning the graph, we simultaneously learn these, uh, this interpolation as well, right? So the distance metric DUV in our original definition would just be a linear combination of uh, uh, we don't know the weights of this linear combination, but it would be a linear combination of the uh, other the, the, the distance metrics from each mode of the data. Right. So uh, then it, it, this has lots of applications, image captioning, media description, and audiovisual speech recognition. Right. So what are uh, what the main challenge in this setting is that now since we move to the this multi-parameter setting, we are discontinuities lie along complex uh, hypersurfaces. So previously, remember, we just had one parameter families, either the threshold or the, uh, go, uh, the exponential bandwidth. Uh, but now we have uh, parameters for the graph in it and as well as the interpolation for the metrics. So this is uh, uh, the, the parameters lie in high dimensions. And the discontinuities for these parameters now lie along uh, uh, essentially these uh, uh, polynomial equations, roots of uh, solutions of polynomial equations. Uh, 
So uh, interestingly, even in this case, we are able to extend our results and show this uh, uh, one over root t uh, convergence to, uh, uh, for the expected average regret. And in this process, we also provide a general tool beyond graph learning because we show, we, we use uh, uh, new mathematical tools to analyze uh, uh, these uh, high dimensional algebraic surfaces. And uh, our results are efficient provided the number of parameters is small, which is reasonable because most of these applications, you just have you know, two or three modes of data. So uh, yeah, our, our performance is quite poor. It's doubly exponential in the number of parameters, but uh, assuming that's constant, we can, our algorithm is also efficient in this case. Now we will give some examples on real world data sets. Uh, so uh, these are popular. We used benchmarks in uh, image classification. You might have seen if you've done any machine learning. So uh, you can have handwritten digits. Uh, the goal would be to categorize uh, these uh, uh, sequence of uh, pixels into uh, and into categories of, of digits. Similarly, OmniGlot is another data set which uh, has alphabets, uh, letters from different languages. And C per 10 is a popular data set with uh, images. Right, so for these uh, data sets, we now compute uh, our loss function. Uh, so we, we take a single instance from these uh, data sets and compute our loss function as a function of uh, the graph parameter. And uh, they lead to these interesting plots. So one thing we observe is that the performance is a strong function of uh, the graph parameter and uh, uh, the accuracy can yeah, vary widely depending upon what graph parameter you choose. So it's important, to, it's crucial to uh, actually carefully select the graph parameter. And the other observation uh, as we had uh, seen theoretically is it's a piecewise constant dependence. Uh, so that makes it challenging to optimize. Yeah. Oh, R is the threshold parameter. So it's when you're adding edges one by one uh, you're increasing the th threshold and adding edges which are less than the threshold one. So it's an, an unweighted graph. Uh, sigma is the weighted graph where you use the uh, RBF kernel or the Gaussian uh, bandwidth. Uh, it treats sigma as the Gaussian bandwidth parameter. What's the metric? The loss, oh yeah, the loss function is just the loss uh, over your unlabeled examples, right? So the, you, the, no, the distance. Oh, uh, the distance metric is, uh, is the image space you would have. Uh, uh, so you're given this vector of pixels for uh, pixel values for your images or uh, characters, and uh, you just compute the uh, L2 distance between the uh, uh, between the features. Uh, good questions. Uh, and if we do this over a lot of uh, uh, instances you can see that you know there is a lot of variation in the optimal parameters as you draw different instances from the same data set so clearly this is uh, uh, and uh, even if you're just drawing random iid instances from the same data set so this uh, can be a challenging online learning problem uh, to actually learn the optimal value of the parameter so you have a bunch just just to simulate an online learning uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, so it's just a simulation for what you might see in the online setting, but another motivation could be where you are seeing new problem instances, uh, which is also something that our algorithms can handle because, you know, in the online framework, there is no real connection assumed between uh, the sequence of uh, problems. Uh, yeah, but just for the sake of these experiments, we and, and just to look at what happens in real data sets, we, we uh, construct these plots. Right. Uh, and we also implement our algorithm. Uh, so, uh, and, we, and we plot this uh, average regret that we see in different rounds. And uh, it's uh, interesting to see that our algorithm, you know, for example, in C for 10, it's uh, as almost uh, within 2% of your best possible parameter uh, within just 30 iterations of the uh, problem, drawing problem sequences. Uh, 
Uh, so yeah, as you see, can see, you, you have this uh, convergence to the optimal parameter, which is uh, uh, reasonably fast uh, using our algorithm. Right, so with that, I uh, can try to summarize the main results and uh, uh, you know uh, maybe discuss directions for future work. So the first key takeaway is that uh, we uh, need this data-driven formulation to enable graph learning. So maybe this was one of the blind spots in this uh, you know decades of work on graph uh, on graph-based semi-supervised learning, why people focused on uh, the uh, labeling algorithm and not the graph construction or treat it as, it as an art is just because uh, uh, people focused on a single problem instance. But if you look at it as you know multiple problem instances and uh, the ability to learn these parameters uh, from multiple instances is uh, an in, in, interesting way to look at this problem, which hasn't been looked at before. So with respect to our main results, we have, uh, we. Uh, demonstrated the learning the graph itself is crucial and uh, we can learn near optimal graphs uh, which are comparable to the optimal parameters in performance and uh, we can also do this computation uh, of our, uh, efficiently using uh, this idea of feedback sets which where we just compute the boundary of uh, the constant performance interval uh, for the loss function and finally we can also handle multimodal data uh, using a uh, uh, little more complex analysis. And we also demonstrate the usefulness of our uh, algorithms and uh, on, on real data sets. Some directions for potential future work. Uh, so we can learn graphs over larger data sets. Uh, so the idea is, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the idea is that our algorithm still needs n, n to the four running time, which might be reasonable you know, for running over small instances, but uh, if you run on typical data sets with, which machine learners work with, they are of the order of millions of uh, uh, examples, labeled and unlabeled examples. So uh, we can, uh, in a promising direction is to think about how to make uh, this algorithm even more efficient potentially with some, you know, some amount of approximation in the guarantees. Another direction is to reduce the number of labels. So, so far we've assumed that our, uh, we have a fixed set of labels, uh, which are already annotated. We don't know where we got them from, but we uh, assume they're given. Uh, a direction which uh, is known as active learning is to also try to minimize these uh, labels, uh, the examples that get labeled by selecting them in an intelligent way. So that can further reduce the annotation costs. And finally, uh, there are, uh, we, our focus here was on the min cut and uh, 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 the classical algorithms like the min cut and the uh, soft min cut, but there are potential extensions to uh, modern labeling algorithms like graph neural networks, which are more challenging to analyze, but uh, uh, you know, what our techniques mean in those settings is uh, another interesting uh, question. So uh, that's all I had for this talk. Thank you for attending. So I might need to use this screen uh, line. Uh, can you explain what is the, uh, in a more, Yeah, so yeah, the dispersion is just uh, a requirement or uh, an assumption on the uh, uh, loss functions or the data sets. So it's an assumption of the data set which says that your data distribution is not the worst case distribution or it's not a very 
bad distribution. Uh, it satisfied certain properties, uh, which essentially say that, you know, uh, small perturbations to your data set do not change their label too much, right? Uh, that's, that's roughly speaking what uh, these assumptions correspond to. So the dispersion is an assumption on your data set, which if it satisfies, uh, if your data distribution satisfies, then you can, uh, you can give good guarantees for the algorithms. So the assumption is that small change to the data do not change the label, right? So yeah. by using the intuitive example you've shown, mm -hmm. Does that mean like uh, the boundary is not objective? I mean, the boundary has to be true or, uh, or the bar has to be connected in some way? So the graph, uh, it's, it's, it doesn't have to be connected, but just that uh, the, so in this example, uh, if you perturb all your points just a little bit, right? If you change your distance metric, uh, you, uh, the, the idea is that the exact location of the points or the exact feature values is not very important. These are some sort of approximate no, no, notions of uh, what your points are. If you look at this graph, mm -hmm. and this is graph in example. Right? Yeah. So, like how do you explain this version or maybe this using this graph? Yeah, so in this graph, uh, if you perturb all your points just a little bit, all the, uh, they, they should essentially be the same uh, point, right? In other words, uh, you can think of this feature. So th these points are essentially, you know, correspond to some real examples, right? An email, right? Uh, this is a representation of an email. So if that represent, the point is that its representation is not exact. So if the point, uh, if for example, this uh, red point is just moved a little bit to the left or the right, that uh, it just uh, doesn't change the problem in any meaningful way. And you can do this for all points. So in other words, you can think of these locations are coming from some distribution and not being very precise. Okay, so you just mean robust Yeah, 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 yeah. So that's just the assumption. Yeah, that's the assumption. But what do you think, I still don't understand the intuition of the algorithm. The algorithm, okay, so the algorithm is, uh, Essentially, so uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the algorithm is trying to learn this uh, piecewise constant loss function. It turns out that the, the loss as a function of the graph parameter uh, is is piecewise constant. In other words, you know there are these sharp jumps in the loss function, right? And uh, it, the graph and the loss is flat for the other parts, right? And uh, you want to uh, learn which of these flat parts of the domain are more are uh, are you know minimizing the loss? Right? So you want to learn which which parts of the domain are more effective, or which which value of the graph parameters lead to low loss on average across all the problems that you see. Right? Suppose you see a bunch of the, uh, these uh, the examples of this uh, in this graph problem, and uh, in each example you would see this piecewise constant function. Uh, so you want to identify the region of your uh, uh, graph where uh, yeah, for example, you want to identify, for example, in this data set, the parameter values where, you know, the, on average, the algorithm performs well, right? And in order to do that, the, what the algorithm does is on each of these pieces, on each of these intervals, uh, you record the loss and you exponentiate it, you know, you weight it highly and uh, you, Keep adding it up across all instances, and you and you draw uh, new values of the parameter. So you're required to draw a new value of the parameter for each new problem, right? So before you see the loss function, you are required to give the graph. Uh, that's the online setup, and uh, in this setup, you would uh, want to uh, learn. So you essentially learn the value of the uh, parameter which, uh, which are performing well on average. Yeah, yeah, the structure is defined. Uh, yeah. So there's certain kind of rule. Yeah. Which you you vary the similarity of the concept of that and then you decide whether it's connected or not. But you're depending on signal, for example, then 
and you want to basically a certain range of stigma, you don't want to increase that it's in a long time. Yeah, yeah, you you want you want that values of sigma or of the parameter where where the loss is minimum is small and it uh, stays small for you know on an average over your problems. So, for example, in the average data set. Yeah. Uh, so you're trying to look for like the region around two. Yeah, yeah, yeah precisely. So uh, an algorithm to learn two, and if you look at just one example, you know there might be multiple minima. It's the non-convex or uh, non-Lipschitz function. Uh, you know, it has it does it doesn't satisfy the usual smoothness and uh, no, global optimality assumptions. Yeah, so in, from a, that, that, that's the point. So we made the point that from a single example, it's not possible to learn the best value of the parameter. There can be multiple good values. You need to look at multiple instances uh, to actually learn the parameter. Oh, okay. so this is the yeah. Now, yeah, in, in a sense, yeah, you take an average, you also, well, expo you take the average loss and exponentiate it uh, and use that to, you know, uh, and the algorithm is randomized in the sense that it uh, uh, predicts a particular parameter with certain probability. And that probability is proportional to this exponentiated weight in that for that uh, parameter, All right? So that's the uh, yeah. Uh, that's the algorithm here. So you maintain exponentiated weights for each of these pieces or each of these intervals uh, that you can compute. Is it possible to um, like? Adapt to the local geometry of the detail space. That is, for example, there are some different like parameters at different regions of the detail space. Yeah, that's that's a very interesting question. So, uh, the graph families that we consider are have just a single parameter for the entire uh, domain. Uh, but yeah, you can imagine graph families which are uh, uh, you know. Uh, where you want to learn different different weights in uh, uh, for different examples and uh, yeah so you would you would need to come up with potentially new graph families which also handle this uh, you know uh, local uh, variation case yeah yeah one question I have like a I guess like a general question like uh, you but I, and I don't quite understand why it doesn't work. So like with this uh, this version assumption, uh, so if I understand correctly, it's like these, uh, like the constant parts uh, of the of the of the loss for the value of sigma should be uh, like in general sort of wide so you don't have like too many distinct communities. So it's thinking like what happens if you start like sigma for example from zero and then you just increase it like with a constant like I don't know, 10 to the minus six could be like shouldn't need there be like a hyperbole of like lending the size and interval that's like the, the minimum constant. Yeah, yeah. So that's uh that's in fact that's what uh so that's something that people call grid search and uh, that's uh uh an algorithm that people actually use in practice. It's a simple to implement algorithm. Uh, we will argue our algorithm is also simple to implement. I think the difference is uh, uh, our algorithm has just just has formal guarantees of you know uh, of uh, you know convergence rates. And uh, if, if you uh, use just the grid search, uh, you know you, it's it's hard to give formal guarantees of you know how what what should be the grid size and uh, you know that those questions are not answered or are not known at this point. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So 
That, that's that's definitely a good point. The, the reason is, yeah, uh, you, you would want to use those points uh, in general, for, for especially for examples when, uh, where we, we did our experiments, where we drain from the same data set. But uh, for the general online setting, if you try to prove things about these things, uh, yeah, since we can't make any assumptions on you know the next next data set in the sequences related, uh, how is it related to the previous uh, instance? Uh, it's uh, the only assumption that we make is this this weak assumption of you know the discontinuities are not highly correlated. Uh, under this assumption, uh, you know, that, that's a very weak assumption. It doesn't, you know, rule out, it doesn't imply that your data distribution is going to remain same over uh, multiple, uh, you know, over the long term. So it might, for example, if it's a real online application, your user base might change or, you know, this is more adaptive or, uh, um, yeah, more adaptive to this online setting. No, I guess the question was like to evaluate the loss itself. You assume you have an able for yeah. Oh, yeah. So that point. that's an interesting question. So yeah, uh, typically in practice you wouldn't really get all the labels because again the motivation was you know you would want to avoid this cost of labeling everything. And uh, for example, if you have this email server, uh, you can get an estimate of this loss based on some user feedback, right? So when people complain, oh, this was spam or they drag some email into spam so that you get some sort of feedback and it's, you don't end up labeling everything but you know if it's a service that's deployed you can yeah, estimate it's, I guess it. it's also like in the learning phase maybe you can assume you have labels, labels yeah, for yeah. all the points now you have a sigma and in a new case you only need two labels to interpolate to all them. yeah yeah that's uh, another reasonable uh, uh, formulation There aren't any more questions at time.